All right, um, let's start. First of all, I'm very happy to be here and I wanna thank all the organizers for inviting me. Even though uh, they didn't choose me last year, I am happy that they did this year. <laughs> I didn't know that, so maybe good to know. Um, yeah, and uh, for the people that are not from here, welcome to my country. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, okay, let's go. Um, as you can see, the title of my talk, it's gonna be Creativity in Machine Learning. And uh, as we said, I am Constantina Pal and I work in Spotify. Um, a bit now about, about myself. I'm a senior research scientist in Spotify, as Francesco said. In Spotify, I'm working in content moderation in simple words. This means that I build and I research algorithms that actually their role is to make sure that whatever content goes on the platform is safe. But it's not only safe for the audience, but also um, values and uh, safeguards, let's say, the creativity of the artists. I find myself quite lucky um, because I also love creativity in the sense that I like to protect uh, the rights of the artists and the creators in general. Um, apart now from the digital realm of my everyday life, I also like to express myself creatively in different ways, not always successfully or not always beautifully. Uh, so I like drawing, um, but I also like to play with clay. Um, I also challenge myself to put out there my artworks publicly on my website, not because it's nice, just because I, I like putting myself out there, uh, even in aspects that I am not very proud of, but I'm working on. So maybe I challenge that you do the same. Now, when we consider machine learning and creativity, as the title of this talk is, a lot of questions might rise, right? I am sure that each one of you right now is already thinking different questions that lie underneath this big topic. Some of them might be, what is creativity? Or how can AI create art? Or what computers can computers create art? And if computers can create art, what does that mean for the artists or for the, creati for the creating process itself? And of course, the biggest question uh, that I actually had when I start being interacting or start being involved in these questions and these topics is, why do we care now? Why is this happening now? Why is this discussion happening now? And it's on, in press publicly every day, we see all these creations that are diversified and create a lot of sensation. These are all these are all the questions that I will try in my talk to answer in a way, but not in a complete way. I would say I will try to give pointers for further discussion. And in the past few years, we have seen a big boom in the domain of creativity using machine learning. And this, of course, um, as I said, we can see that in everyday life with creations that are boosted by machine learning, and make it to the press and also challenge our faith, even of what is realistic or it is fake or what will happen to their creativity in the future. If we were now to point out a specific point in time in the history of when these things, all this topic of machine learning popped up in the domain of creativity, then many people will suggest that this happened with a deep dream. Deep dream was a computer program and it's still a computer program that was invented by an engineer in Google. And it's actually a convolutional neural network that it has the ability to create this kind of dreamy like images. All it does, it is takes one image and it actually uh, distorts this image to look like hallucination. And however, it sounds simple to us right now. However, back then, it was a pivotal moment because it was actually the first creation that showed that machine learning can actually be and can actually invent, uh, can actually be inside and change the creativity of uh, uh, the creative process. It was the first incident, let's say, of uh, a machine learning algorithm that was able to create artistic um, products of art. A few years later, of course, things evolved a lot. Now we are talking about images or even, up, let's say, most, more specifically, um, systems that can create way better 
images and creations in general, because we're not talking about images, we may talk about music or movies even more. Examples like the ones that you can see here in my slide are um, showing how much diversity machine learning algorithms like DALI or Imagine by Google or Midjourney can actually evolve the and even enhance the creativity and the skills of the artists. Image creation, of course, is not the only domain that machine learning generated creations made their appearance in. Examples we have also in painting, sculpture, or even clothing design. Ida, that you can see here on the right, on the left, um, is an Android that was, in, that was invented in 2019, that was constructed in 2019, created in 2019, to put it rightly. And it's actually able to create paintings, sculpture, or even um, sculptures from 3D designs that it makes. We also have example of AI generated creation in uh, sculpture. In Sweden, you can see there in the middle, there is a statue that was actually created after training algorithms like deep neural networks on a really long a collection of um, art, uh, of designs of Michelangelo and Rodin and so on and so forth. And then the machine learning algorithm was able to create the design and then um, they printed, 3D printed the sculpture. We also have the example in the clothing design where a company called JSTAR uh, used the Mid Journey, which is a text to image application system. And they played with different prompts to create designs of algorithms. And they actually decided to use one of these design and turn it into an actual clothing, an actual garment. So we actually see that things are happening and by happening, I mean things are coming into our everyday life in different aspects of it. The field, field of music has also affected, has been affected by the introduction of machine learning, uh, no doubt. We have the program IDA, which I will show you an example of. And program IDA is just a machine learning algorithm that was trained in a, a different music compositions of different um, composers like Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, and was actually able to compose music itself, new music itself. And it's actually quite fascinating. And I hope that this will play as we try. Let's see. So we can definitely see that the general that the algorithm is producing, the general of music is classical music because that was the training data that was being used uh, for its training. However, it's quite impressive and you can imagine other kind of genres that we can create by using machine learning algorithm and put in place a training process and of course, computing power as well. Um, another interesting example that I find quite fascinating of the application of machine learning is in the field of movies. Um, right, and now it's explaining because I was having problems before. As you can see here, we have two examples of newsies that new movies that were actually created using machine learning. They're still in very early ages or stages in the domain of movies. Um, for example, the one, uh, the first one that you see here on the left is called The Frost and is actually a movie, a short movie that was created by using text to image prompts and, uh, and systems. And then the creators put together the images into a flow, uh, again, using el elaborated algorithms. The other one, the Genesis on the right, um, is made in similar way, text to image, uh, with the creators actually created, uh, spend more than 1000 hours uh, trying different prompts in the system uh, to get as a result, as an output, different images, and then um, they put them together. They actually noted, they actually told that they had to create more than 20,000 images 
to make the small trailer. Still, it's early ages, but still is quite impressive. And you can imagine, you can actually already see and take a flavor of all the capabilities and possibilities and the potential of machine learning that can create also in uh, the industry of film. Um, now what is happening is also, apart from us noticing all these creations, what you also notice in the different fields of machine learning, uh, of art, what you also notice is that slowly while all these creations were causing sensation and it was becoming it was coming up as a novelty suddenly they're also coming a commodity that means something that we are not surprised to see anymore think about it we are not surprised anymore something that even five or six years ago we wouldn't even believe that is going to happen so suddenly our attitude and our acceptance towards that has raised we can also see that we can also see that this is being manifested in how the press, how the actual magazines that we actually see in our physical life adopt this by even creating covers that use this kind of machine learning algorithms, machine learning tools. So it's happening and we're actually accepting it. Slowly, the machine learning create the machine learning generated creations in art are making their way in our everyday lives in all ways possible. The increasing popularity that we're just discussing about this of this machine learning um, arts um, creations is leading also to the integration of these creations into areas and play spaces that traditionally were only associated with creations made from by humans, only by humans. We can think spaces like museums or auction houses or agencies now actually accepting and are promoting work of arts that are generated using machine learning. And this is happening and this is happening fast. As a site, as, as a nice, as a nice um, fact, the painting that you can see, the generated AI generated painting that you can see on the left called, I need to remember, Portrait of Edmund de Bellamy. It was actually created using guns and the technology that Xenia earlier today talked to you about. And it was actually sold in 2019 in the Christie's in the uh, auction house in New York for almost above $400,000. So things are happening and machine learning technology is actually entering and changing uh, the spaces that were traditionally assigned to human creations. Standing up the headlines, uh, there's been a blend of uh, fascination and concern, of course, of this and the change that um, talking, making discussions about whether we should accept machine learning or machine learning in art, whether this is changing uh, the status quo and whether this is positive or negative. So we have a bit of a, of a mix of sensations, a mix of types of feelings, and this actually being depicted in the press as well, almost every day and online articles and even online discussions around it. In this talk now, in this talk, um, what I will try to, to what I will try to achieve is to cover a bit of a couple of things. Um, I will try to give a brief history of machine learning and the tech that actually is responsible for all of this. In put it simple, I'll try to answer why, how we came to this point. Um, I will also discuss, of course, the impact that these machine learning technologies have in the artist and also in their creativity as a process itself. And finally, we'll spend some time discussing about the opportunities, but also the challenges slash concerns that this kind of um, uh, exaggerated progress in machine learning in art is bringing on the table. Um, by the way, I'm happy to take questions during the talk. Um, if anyone has questions, otherwise happy to take after the talk. All right, let's start for the most important question uh, with the most important question, at least for me. Uh, which is why now? Why is this happening now? We're discussing about this right now. Uh, all these technologies you may be aware of can be, have been going on for more than 50 years, but why, as in like machine learning has been affecting art and the creative post process for some years right now. Why are we talking about it only now? Why do we care about it only now? Let's see why, or let's try and answer this. 
maybe some of you have a different opinion. This is my point of view. So AI-generated art has been around for some years. We're talking about probably going back into the mid or uh, late 20s, around 60s and 70s, where we have the first algorithms that are creating, um, I thought that was a problem, that were creating some art generated by uh, algorithms that are actually very simple in the sense that we're not talking about uh, um, generating unseen art, but they are following instructions, simple, put instructions. The very first example in this domain is one of the first examples, not the very first example, is the work by um, Harold Quinn um, around the 70s uh, or somewhere there. Uh, Harold Quinn was an artist, but also a researcher and professor uh, in the US and created the program called Aron. Aron can be thought as a small machine uh, that was uh, designed by Harold to create small figures and then Harold was going on top of them to paint them. So this was the first thing, the first, let's say, official um, point where we can say that algorithms created by humans were introduced in a way that people could actually create art. Okay. Another example is the work by Vera Molnar. Um, the work is called Generative Compositions. It's a series of computer-generated uh, drawings and geometric shapes that were creating using simple algorithms again, a language that you may be familiar with or not, called BASIC. So it's a very prime language, prime language. Fast forward now, we're bringing uh, the time, the, the clock in 2010, 2010. We have the early AI art projects of the 60s and 70s. We have the realization that these early projects were not actually super fascinating anymore um, and were limited in their capabilities as they were mainly based on simple algorithms with limited instructions possible and limited uh, potential. Zooming ahead by several decades, the landscape underwent a remarkable transformation. Neural networks search on the front but also it was not only the technology of neural network, but also the availability of open uh, data sets. So we have data sets like ImageNet in combination with all these algorithms like neural networks made, us, made it possible for us to enter the golden era of deep learning. Now researchers and other uh, pra practitioners are building on the idea of neural networks and making bigger architectures that we now call um, deep neural networks and they require training on a huge amount of data, but we also have this huge amount of data because people can actually now scrape the internet and get amount of data like images, text, so new uh, doors to power open for us. And along with that, with this kind of progress, um, the potential in changing the art is there, is getting close. Ahead now in 2015, um, we have the year again, as I said, where Deep Dream happens. Um, it was one of the earliest instances, as I said, uh, that demonstrated how neural networks can actually be used in art. The core idea of the Deep Dream is quite simple. It can be put in a question that says, what patterns do you see in the image? Now amplify it. The goal is to enhance the patterns and the features that the neural networks uh, detect within an image, and it does so by forward payments. Put it very simple in a very summarized way. Okay, I hear the noise. Um, the goal is to enhance the patterns, as I said, um, and the features of the neural network. And the way this is achieved, the image is put into the network um, and forward inside the different layers. And then at each layer, we calculate the gradient of the image with respect uh, to the activations of the particular layer. And the image is then modified to increase this kind of activations. By doing this in different layers, the artist now is able to create these dreamlike uh, images. To note here is that we don't really create new art, but we just change how the image that we put into the network changes. As simple as that, uh, however, the new algorithm, the Deep Dream, was able to be hugely adapted by the community. Around the same year, 2014, we have the other uh, algorithm that was actually discussed by Xenia. We have the GANs. 
the Generative Adversarial Networks. Uh, the GANs were introduced uh, in 2014, and we also we can also claim that they revolutionized the uh, art because now we enter the area of generative AI with GANs. Now we are actually able to create artists or creators are able to create new images or unforeseen images, unseen images, to put it in another way. Um, there, in their structure, uh, or um, may, if you remember from what Xenia said earlier this morning, they consist of two neural networks. Uh, one is uh, the generator and the other is the discriminator. And they compete in this kind of setup where the discriminator is trying to decide uh, more successfully whether the image that the generator is producing is fake or real, while at the same time, the generator is trying to decide as is actually trying to become better, better at uh, producing better images. By doing so, we are actually have a powerful tool now that art with, with which artists are able to create hyper-realistic images. And this is something really pivotal. This innovative approach to machine learning has led to a surge of interest, of course, as expected. Uh, tech companies now start open sourcing. Um, they are rowing untrained guns. Uh, we have Google and also Meta with frameworks like TensorFlow and Torx. And this also changed a lot because now creators can go and download these tools and can play around. And they can have access to the, even the training algorithms and they can create their own uh, works by scratch. Examples of this kind of work can be seen in many different ways and many different fields. Uh, let's see this place. Really we have now works from Memo Atkin, as you can see, um, using guns, and they can actually create this piece of videos that shows how by inputting a random um, image into the uh, input of the algorithm, what you get out is this kind of interesting and creative outputs. People have been really surprised and really intrigued by these creations. Things are changing, are still changing. We also have Mauro Martino, another artist that is actually also using, uh, extensively used and still using guns to also create, um, uh, express uh, his creativity. And his style is more like using an or having a, a, an input to the uh, model as an image. And then the model, the gun, is able to transfer the style of painting on the initial image. Right. Um, Sorry, I have uh, my laptop is getting a bit fuzzy. All right, seems it was a uh, flickering. I'm sorry about that, guys. Um, vari variational time counters is another architecture that appears pretty much at the same time around 2014, and adds another layer of complexity in the generative art. They are based on the concept of variational inference. If you remember from following Senya this morning, um, which is a way of actually of approximating distributions. Um, in terms of architecture, they, com they consist of an encoder and decoder, but what is surprising and novel here is that latent space that they create. If you remember from the lecture, by using, by uh, creating um, this latent space, now we give control to the creations, to the users um, inside this latent space to able to actually sample from this latent space and create new art, new images. By doing so, for example, the, the artist um, is able to introduce different noises inside the uh, latent space and get a sample to different outputs, different images. Yeah, I think it was featuring with the cables. So far, so good. If, if it happens again, I'll let you know. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if you guys see it well, but for me it was flickering a bit. Um, hopefully, no. Okay. 
Um, examples of variational encoder now. Um, examples of variational encoders we can find many, of course, in art, in uh, images, and uh, other areas. Here I provide um, examples a bit far further away from the uh, domain of images, not overwhelming with images. Um, one nice example is the so-called music variational encoder. That is an algorithm that is able to actually produce uh, music. You train it on specific um, genres or on, on specific instruments, and then is able to create new music based on this training. Let's hear it. This version is uh, uh, trained on drums. Small one, but good one. Um, so you can see now that other areas are of, of human uh, creativity is also being affected hugely by this. And the same happened also in generation of lyrics as well. Fast forward, we're going to 2017. Um, this area now, this year is um, stamped by the creation, by the uh, invention of transformers. You may be familiar with transformers, this powerful architecture of machine learning. And we have to say one thing about transformers is that they actually change the way we understand language. Think about it, with transformers, it was possible now to understand the language, to have a better understanding of the depth of the natural languages. And we're better at dealing with text. So we have the modality now of text coming into play. We already, we can, you can say that by now, with the different architectures and different algorithms that we went through this uh, trip in history, we know, uh, we can say that we have a good understanding and a good way to manipulate images so far. But now also text is coming into play. The modality of text is being um, attacked, let's say, by machine learning algorithms. Another interesting part and um, fact about transformers is now that they can actually uh, scale very, very well. And uh, this is an interesting fact because they can actually be deployed um, in GPUs and also, that exactly what happened by big companies with increased computing power. This made possible for systems like GPT um, or BERT that you may be familiar with to come into play, to happen, to be created. All, both of these extremely powerful architectures like GPT and BERT are actually using transformers. And they're super powerful and super competent at dealing with text. And now we're entering the era of multimodal models. As I said, we deal with, we know how to deal with images and we know how to deal with text. What is left to be done is to actually uh, find a way to combine uh, these, uh, these abilities into one so that we can both manipulate text and emails at the same time. In the space of representation, what this actually means is now that we want the ability and we are able with the multimodal models, multimodal models to actually project or represent, to use more of the technical term, represent both text and image on the same embedding space. And why is this and why is this important? Why do we care about that? Actually this is very, very important because now Technologies like text to image are able to actually work in this area, if I may allow to say so, work in this embed space um, in the way that is super fascinating. For example, with the input of a text prompt, as a text prompt, um, in this example, I have a dog that looks like cat. What happens in the embed, with the system in the embed space, in the latent space, is that the system goes this in the latent space using um, the representation of the text and also finds the closer by um, representation of emails. So we have the ability to now map text to images, if I have to say it in a simple way. Imagine how powerful this becomes, how powerful now we become using technologies like that. We're able to manipulate both text and images. The first model to claim this capability 
um, this holy grail, if we may say, um, sufficiently enough with which quality is DALI. DALI was released in the beginning of 2012 by OpenAI. Um, how many of you have played around with DALI or tried to play? All right, good deal. Um, so it's super exciting. I was super excited to try. Um, now again, after a while, it's a commodity. I'm not surprised anymore. Going back to what we say, we are being surprised, but then things happen so fast and another thing has happened and we are, uh, we stop high, uh, we're losing the surprising factor. But let's go back to DALI. Um, DALI was, what was important about DALI, of course, architecture wise is that it was able to combine the text and, and, uh, and image, but imagine you being a creator now, a, an artist, suddenly you can actually have control on the image that you want to create by, through text. You can put a random prompt or a prompt that you are working on and think of and try new images as an, and get the new images and variety of images as an output. Imagine how immensely crazy and powerful this is for creators. Um, if we're gonna ask the question, is this, is Dali really so powerful? Is it really so magical? I would say it depends on how do you ask about it, why you ask about it, and what are you exactly, what do you exactly mean? In terms of algorithms, it's not that DALI was based on something that was novel. The algorithms were already there. And that's the point I would try to make by going this into the strip of history. All the algorithms that DALI was based on, like VA or text processing with transformers, was already there. What was missing is putting them together in a way that works. And that's exactly what happened. The, uh, the clever people, researchers, competent researchers, and um, of course, uh, 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 researchers that have access to a lot of computing power, what they did is that they tried different architectures and the one that worked is actually the one that made Tally so powerful. I'm not gonna go into a lot of details, but you can imagine that we're talking about text and image. So we have transformers that deal with text. And in the implementation of DALI, we have the powerful GPT that has 12 billion parameters. And of course, we have variational transponders that are able to uh, uh, manipulate the image and create image encodings. And what I want to stress out here, um, I will skip a bit uh, fast, a bit, uh, I will not go into the details in the architecture here during the inference, but I want to stress out that again, Nothing new is in, is in terms of algorithms. However, what is new is putting together these components in a way that works and having access to a huge amount of training data. DALI was trained in millions I and mean, billions of, uh, of pairs of uh, images and captions in order to achieve these powerful results. Last year now, um, Almost, almost a bit more than a, a year ago, in June 2022, we have a more advanced version of DALI, which is DALI 2. We're talking about now in the area where we have the diffusion models. Um, as you know from the lecture earlier, diffusion models is another uh, way of uh, producing images or manipulating images, um, but it's done in a way in a gradual uh, diffusion way, in a way that uh, reminds the way also of um, how the artistic, uh, the artists actually create their paintings slowly, slowly. Um, and that's probably reminds you of the diffusion process. Um, what is also interesting about the diffusion models now and why they advance the capabilities of DALI too, is that they're now uh, architects and no, sorry, artists are able to create more fine grained with more details images. So the advancement now from DALI 1, DALI 2 to DALI 2 is that now we have more um, ability uh, to super realistic, greater ability to create realistic images with a lot more details and a lot of better capturing of also, and as a result also better capturing of the realism in the images. I, I, because I'm tracking the time, I will skip the architecture. Um, but I wanna make the point here is that things are happening fast nowadays in the sense that more and more architectures and more and more companies are joining the game of text to image. 
of the multimodal uh, that are based in the multimodal mo models. What is very, very interesting is that um, a lot of the companies, they're not open sourcing their code, but they're also companies at the same time that they do so. They provide their algorithms online and you can have access and go and see and uh, manipulate and play and try your own and alter, try your own ideas and alter them. And this is super interesting. And uh, this also gave the ability to a lot of creators um, to not being involved only as a user to the API of these systems, but also as a creator, as a technician, let's say, of the algorithm. And you can think about it now that also artists are not only users, that has probably that we can um, uh, think of only users of the system, but are also actual creators of the algorithms as well. So now going back to the initial question that started this chapter of my talk, why is this happening now? The merging of generative AI is astonishing um, and uh, the contributions are equally uh, astonishing and um, very, uh, let's say, diverse. Um, if we now want to answer this question why this is happening right now, I would say from my talk, this is happening because of the fusion of three important things data, algorithms, and immense computing power. We have data that we can extract from the internet, huge amount of data. We have algorithms that have been building up for the last decade or so, and they're still evolving and are still being built up. And of course, we have companies that can provide the computing power, the uh, increased number of GPUs that these algorithms can be trained on. Now we are moving to the next uh, chapter of my talk, which is all about the creativity and the artist. We're moving away from the technology that made um, this uh, machine learning systems possible. And we're thinking and we're discussing, or um, let's say contemplating about what is the impact on the role of the artist, how its traditional role is changing but also the impact on the creativity as a process. Traditionally, when we think, when we think of an artist, we always think of them in a physical contact with the medium they're working with. We imagine them painters as someone that is holding a brass in their painting, or if you are a sculptor that you're holding the chisel, or if you are working with clay, you're touching, uh, molding the clay. Or have you're using your fingers. However, this is now changing. If you are an artist that you are using also machine learning as part of your creative process, you don't necessarily have, like, you're not necessarily touched, physically touched the medium, but your medium now is an algorithm. The whole ecosystem of the creative process is changing. You may simply see behind, you're using your laptop in behind your screen and you can still create, um, you can still put your imagination and creativity into the art, into the art. So we can claim that the role of the artist is evolved, is transformed, is recast. Now the artist can be thought as part of a process, which I called before ecosystem. Think about how the algorithms work. The algorithms work in a pipeline where you have data, you have the algorithm, the actual algorithm, the actual code that we're implementing, and also you have the output, your creation. Now, as an artist, you can be a part in any of these points. You can actually be responsible for choosing the um, the data that you put into your algorithm. This also might be affected by your intention, what to be as an artist, what to be into the data into the model. Also, you may change the algorithm because you want a slightly different version of it. This also depends on your decision and your creativity. Also, as an artist, you might decide to curate the outcome. So your role now is changing. It's moving away from the traditional understanding and notion of what art, what artist was. So technology and machine learning arises as a new medium to do so. And this is not, not new. Um, we have paintings um, that uh, we can find in the oldest paintings that I ever found in the caves. We also have the Renaissance paintings. 
and we also have uh, sculptures. We also have uh, interactive installations and photography. And what is common about all these examples I mentioned is that um, all these examples used as medium for, for, from the creators to be created as medium, the technology available at time. Always art uses is a reflection of the current time and as a result uses the technology that is present at the time. Of course, as a result, um, it makes sense that now that we're using, in, that we're living in an area full of machine learning uh, creations and systems, artists would also use this as a medium because this is the tech of today, the technology of today. This evolving relationship between artists and the technology um, can also be felt, if, I'm, if you can say so, um, in different ways by artists. There are artists that they feel that the technology is actually creating, is a co-creator that is uh, creating the final outcome along with them. So they see them as a Way, as, a, as a system that works along with them, not separately. So they're equally involved, equally involved in the creative process. An example of this is the artist called Sigmund Sang, and I was um, um, I was actually honored to attend one of her talks. She speaks beautifully about her art and thinks of machines more as a collaborator um, than Zan's tools. In her project, one of the most famous ones called um, drawing operations she engages in a drawing performance with a robotic arm and the robotic arm for the ones that might wonder is actually trained using deep learning on the gestures that she is using while drawing in a sense the robotic arm has learned uh, from the visual style of her works and outputs a machine interpretation during the human robotic uh, during the human robot uh, duet Another artist, uh, um, other, uh, another category of artists, however, feel that machine learning is not um, a co-creator, or that machine learning is not a co-creator, is more like a part of the creative process, more like a collaborator, they call it. Um, and what what differ, differentiates them from the previous ones is that um, they have they have opt uh, for a more hands-off approach. Uh, along with the, the, the AI, the machine learning to generate artwork autonomously and then interpreting or curating the results. So they just press the button for the algorithm to run and then the artist comes to actually um, curate the final output. An example of this is the video that you saw, uh, which I will play again to explain a bit over. Here we have Scott Eaton. Uh, Scott Eaton, what is, he, he actually, he used the machine learning algorithm. Um, it was a, a gun, a general, general adversarial um, network. And it trained the network into um, drawings, into photographs that he took. And then he gave it as input drawings and the algorithm was able to actually create this figurative representations. Um, so the artist now, Scott, chose the result, chose the data uh, where the algorithm is trained on and also curates the output as well. Just being between, he just pressed the, uh, press the button. So the evolving relationship between artists and AI as co-creators or collaborators, depending on how the different artists um, perceive them, has the potential to greatly enhance creativity. This transformation in the creative process is a result of artists, artists that the create creators actually embracing the advance of the machine learning systems and not attacking or not um, rejecting this advancement. But let's see other areas that machine learning systems can actually affect positively um, that. Perhaps the most significant one, uh, the most significant impact of machine learning on art or more specifically in digital art um, is the new creative possibilities that they offer. Uh, machine learning brings, we can say that by using these machine learning tools and create a diverse variety of aesthetics and styles, machine learning brings a lot of novelty, a lot of new ideas, 
even the artists now can play around and can create, uh, can bring into reality their different imaginative ideas that they may have until they actually uh, conclude to the final one. And they can do that in a very fast, in a very fast way. Um, imagine how powerful this is. They might even, uh, in a way, they are able to create new styles very fast. And even arts uh, that will probably wouldn't have been possible with uh, just the human as the creator only and not the machine, the machine involved. Um, another uh, big advantage of using machine learning uh, in the uh, creative process um, is also the accelerator of the creative process of the creative of the creative process in other areas beyond the traditional artistic domain. Uh, you can think, for example, architects. Architects can use the text to image systems that are supported, powered by machine learning, to try new designs, and they can speed up the production. Uh, they can speed up the decision of the design and the submission of their final work. And the same for product designers. They can try new ideas very fast. And this can also bring a lot of impact, positive impact in the pipeline of um, their design uh, production. We wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't conclude, we wouldn't be able to finish the discussion about the positive impact without talking about diversity. How diversity, how using machine learning in art can actually increase the diversity that we uh, observe in the creations, but also in the ability to become an artist. We have access and also creators and artists have access to tools that are open source and the barrier to entry is really low. You don't even know to have a lot of technical understanding. You can actually open your laptop, turn on your laptop as long as you have a Wi-Fi and you can start creating art. And imagine that how powerful this is and how optimistic for people, um, that how positive it is for people that are uh, in every possible corner of the earth as soon as they have Wi-Fi. They, we don't have geographical boundaries anymore in the art also. Uh, then accessibility is increased uh, because people uh, that have different disabilities can also create uh, using these tools. And the diversity, the openness to more people also brings as a result, as a next step brings um, diversity in the art itself. More people have a voice to create in creation. A part that I also like to mention, and I had to actually quite recently in my talk, because I think it's very important, is of, of course work on progress and still to and still ex we still expect something to see from it. Um, is that the extensive use of machine learning in the creative field field could also lead us um, towards a future where we better understand our own creativity and their and its intrinsic processes. Um, as, a machine learning, as machine learning algorithms analyze and generate creative works, they offer insights and, uh, into the patterns of how um, uh, human creativity works. So we can think that all the systems can actually help us understand how creativity is manifest, how creativity is empowered intrinsically into us. We wouldn't be telling the whole story if we also don't mention the challenges that may arise from this entrance of the powerful machine learning architectures in art. And there are a couple of them. Um, the most important question is who is getting the credit that we can start with actually is the, who is getting the credit. And we're talking about now um, who will be the owner of the art. Uh, that is produced, but also this question can be extended in the, in, in, to also include the other side of the coin, which is if something goes bad, who gets the credit, who gets the responsibility for it? Uh, things, in order to answer these questions, um, is not, is not very easy, is, is actually very difficult. And this is because AI as a term and in the ecosystem that the machine learning systems work, um, AI as a term covers a wide range of things involved, as you can actually see in the slide. Um, we have a lot of stakeholders that are being involved when these machine learning systems are created or are trained. We have the people that submit the data, that are owners of the data, the training data. We have the people, the technician, 
um, that actually implements the algorithm. We also have the curators that curate the output, and we also have uh, the user that probably decides the prompt that text that it gets us in, into um, into this system, the text image, uh, for example. So if we have all this this new ecosystem and we have all these different stakeholders, who is going to be responsible for the outcome? Who's going to be of, of the creative outcome? Who's going to be the owner of the creative outcome? So there's no straightforward answer, and there's a lot of, a lot of ongoing discussions. Um, it's going to be, it'll take some time, and but hopefully we'll get there. The conversation then uh, quickly shifts to copyright issues. Copyright laws generally require human authorship and originality, uh, and as such, making AI generated art ineligible for traditional copyright. So we cannot talk about AI generated art, whether we can uh, assign copyright, because the systems that we have in place, the law that we have in place, only applies for human created art. So having this discussion with the current status law of how things are, it's not adapt. It's not. Um, uh, it, it's not. It's not easy to happen. So things need to change. Things need to change. There are many unknowns, but also there are many many questions. Um, one question that I want to ask you, uh, I can start with, for example, to help you think about it more, is the question about the output. Can you copyright what an AI model creates? And if so. Forms it. If you own the copyright to the input used to train an AI, does that give you any legal claim over the model or the content it creates? As you can see, there's a lot of combinations of questions that we are not in a position to answer just yet. What we can suggest is that copywriting and people are uh, there's a lot of discussion around it is that copywriting and AI models probably will depend on uh, how much involvement the human had or the specific stakeholder had in uh, the towards the creation. But this is only a suggestion. Nothing is put in place uh, just yet. On the other hand, we have the input question. Can we use copyright uh, protected data to train machine learning models? AI use of training data, think about it. AI use of training data could actually vo violate copyright before a new output is generated. I think this is becoming very, very complicated if, you, if, we, if we keep thinking about more and more questions. This was the incident with Getty Images. Um, Getty Images uh, filed uh, a lawsuit against an AI generated generator system for using unlicensed images. Um, and this was actually caused a lot of sensation because one of the first incidents that um, made people worry about uh, uh, about copyrights uh, related to AI. For all these questions, we don't really have clear answers, but rather an ongoing debate. And I would urge you to think that this debate should not be done by me and you, should be done by people that know, by people that know about things about society by a, a diverse group of people, by scientists as well, by technicians, um, because it's an issue that touches different parts of society and different also stakeholders. One thing that you might be already thinking is about the bias, bias in the data. Machine learning tools learn from biases, right? Uh, learn from data. And the data is full of biases. And what worries us uh, as researchers, but also artists, is that when you train a model on data that actually have uh, bias, then it's quite possible or inevitable, actually, that these biases will be um, uh, propagated in the output as well. And you reinforce, instead of actually fight, we will actually reinforce stereotypes. And this is actually happening, and people have explored that this is true with all these systems that are using machine learning to generate art. Uh, we have artists um, that not they don't they're not using machine learning uh, to create art, but actually to show and to underscore to highlight this kind of problems. And uh, we have an artist called Stephanie Dinkin that uses an AI uh, to highlight the biases within the algorithms by thinking about all the types of the representations uh, in the data that we don't have. And one of the examples to try is that um, 
So, so that the black people are not actually represented in the data. So use different prompts, text prompts, and uh, uh, regarding, for example, um, black woman smiling and out of the goat is this distorted image. And this so case that we have a lack of the right representation um, of black uh, people in the data. Um, similar, okay, similar incidents were actually uh, observed in Dali uh, for other cases, for stereotypes, for example, about women. Uh, when you type uh, uh, so many images of stewardess, um, you, also, you only get uh, the majority of the output that you get is women. And similar for CEO, the majority of the images you get is men. So we see all these stereotypes um, are being propagated. So this raised the flag that we definitely need to be aware um, as researchers and scientists and users, but also to find ways to mitigate this problem. And one way is to actually clean our data. However, this raises another kind of discussion and probably we don't have the time for this. Uh, continuing with the challenges associated with uh, unguarded machine learning generated art, um, we also encountered the potential of generating harmful content. And I couldn't really uh, miss that as a point. Um, as we saw, we now have open access to tools um, and a lot of these tools are not safeguarded properly and are also trained in data that are not being curated. As a result, imagine that uh, someone can actually use these tools to create false content, to create content that can uh, propagate mis misinformation or even um, sexually explicit content, even use the face of people for sexually explicit material. And this can go wrong very bad and very fast. So this is something that we should not uh, allow. And this is something that should be aware and the research is also what does that. The capability of these powerful models to generate hyper-realistic images also has an impact in trust. People suddenly are not started being less surprised or less, um, they, they stop admiring. If, if they're being exposed to such a realistic work, they're stopped uh, being surprised anymore by art and photography, by creations in photography that are super realistic as well, because they are. So imagine this confusion, you are stopped admiring the art of photography because you are exposed to super realistic images from generated by machine learning. This raises issues, of course, for the value of art of people and artists, and um, artists are also concerned about this. And this has an impact in the price in the market and problems, uh, and artists are already facing some problems, how to advertise and put the value in their own art, artists that actually create by house there. But let's see, um, I think I am good in time. Let's see a bit of what uh, artists have to say. This is a small snapshot of a video I found. Let's see, it's it's quite interesting. I'm really glad that my livelihood isn't tied to making album art anymore <laughs> as, as it once was, because um, you know, I'm I'm sitting here clicking through ideas in mid journey and coming up with with incredible album covers, one after another, you know. And if I if I'm a musician now. I'm, I'm certainly not going to like try and, you know, use my limited budget to go pay somebody to make one of these things if I can just type this in. Uh, if 10,000 people have access to that same model, will I still be able to make something that then somebody will want to buy? Or don't they want to rather get their own account and make their own images? And why buy my art when you can just find something probably rather similar? I'm sure like some of my artist friends are going to be so crushed because like, it's like I've been trying to tell people and right now like it looks like they they, it's, they still don't get how accessible this is how this is already knocking their door uh so and right now like you know as an artist you, it's already so hard you have to be constantly doing new things and trying to get new gigs so no the world is not fair <laughs> It's not great. It's not nice. And even though like in terms of human creativity potentials and technology and like all these fascinating ideas, I think people thought, wow, this is great. There is also this side in which is like, oh, this is, this is so unfair. You really have to reevaluate. Okay. If anyone can do this, what, what's the currency now? What, what is the value that I bring to the table? 
and maybe the currency of the future is ideas. I think now I understand that like, this is a future where everyone is an art director in a sense, you know, um, it, you, you might not be the artist of it, but you, you guided it, you, you conceived what it is and that's a skill that all in its of itself. So there's, I don't know, <laughs> you know, I'm still working through this. <laughs> All right, um, a lot of great points. Um, it's hard to say whether it's positive or negative, where where should we decide to go with, like, yes, no, should be super happy about it, be concerned. I think we should definitely be concerned. I'm not, but my role is not here to, to tell you what, um, what to do uh, or how to think about it. Um, I think we should be optimistically, optimistically concerned. Uh, that's my answer, but um, let's see. Uh, another another good way to uh, actually help us see how things might evolve in the, in the future is always to look at the past. We can draw lessons from the past. I want to check how I'm doing in terms of time. Five minutes, great. I don't need I don't need more. That's great. Um, so we can actually learn from the past, as I said. Um, the confusion around the future of creativity. Mirrors past instances when traditionalists view the technologies as threatening creativity itself. An example uh, of this has been the 19th century artists saw the advent of, of photography as threat to, pre to painting and specifically to the artists, the painters that were drawing portraits. So there was a lot of fear that will happen now with the rise of photography with the, the artists that draw portraits are not needed anymore. However, surprisingly, instead of replacing painting, photography eventually liberated it from realism. It actually helped to for new mo movements in art to rise, like movement of impressionism. So art is what happened is that painters decided that they need to start working towards a different style, something that is not as a, as a target they don't really have to depict the reality in the most perfect way, because now photography does that. And this is exactly in the slide what I'm trying to communicate by this expert by Van Gogh, which actually, who actually says that I like to use the post impression and the impressions in my style because I don't want to depict the reality anymore. This is what photography does. What I like is to give my own style to my own style. And this is exactly how a new genre of painting arose. And many other examples we can draw. The same thing in computer animation happened that I was. Um, so maybe like all these instances uh, that happened in the past, maybe we can say that uh, using machine learning is not necessarily the downfall for creativity. And this is my last slide. And I wanna close this talk by touching points that Probably they were there underlying during my whole talk, but I didn't really answer. And at this, as a disclaimer, this is how I view things. Can machine learning create art? This is actually the question that maybe some of you have and I didn't really answer straightforward. But my role is not to answer this, but probably I will give my personal opinion or uh, food for thought. In order to answer that, um, I think it's good if I break down this question in two points. The first one, can computers be creative? And I would say that creativity, given the notion of how we understand it right now, creativity is only associated with humans. And computers are not humans. Computers are algorithms made by human. As such, creativity cannot be attributed to machine learning systems. Machine learning systems, at least as they are right now, there are tools that can help your creativity. The other part that I want to draw attention to is that we need to be really careful how the words that we are using, what are communicating, um, what around the skill, what are communicating the skills of machine learning systems. This is the narrative that many people, this is like trap that many people fall in, and we start using narrative that we associate uh, to machine learning with human like agency. This is called anthropomorphism um, of uh, machine learning. And I think this is a very dangerous thing to do. And this can be very, very harmful. 
Machine learning are not humans. Humans are humans. If we start anthropomorphizing machine learning, then we silently imply that they are sentient and they are not, machine learning systems are not sentient. And if we start doing that, so we start being uh, going into discussions around morality and morality is not, there's a huge gap between humans and machine learnings in terms of morality. So I will stop here, that's it. Thank you very much. I hope I gave a food for thought. I'm happy to break questions.